First Corinthians 15. Yes? Getting there. <laughs> the teaching application verse for this morning is John chapter 6 and verse 40. It says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. In Paul's greeting in Romans chapter 1, Paul says this in the first six verses. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Now, when we studied the Romans, I don't remember if I talked about this, but I probably did. Um, but you may have descended, underlined, if you're in Romans chapter 1, you may have it underlined there. The reason is because that's a, that word in the Greek is a very important word for us. The word that is translated as declared in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4 it's the Greek word horizo. That, that probably sounds familiar to you because it's when we get our word for horizon. And its meaning is that of a, a set point, a boundary. And thus, in Paul's introduction to the book of Romans, it's a, a declaration for us. And that declaration is this. The resurrection of Jesus is so absolute that it's undeniable. It declares to us that Jesus is the Son of God without any doubt. Like looking at the, the horizon. You know, we vividly see the dividing point between the earth and the sky. And he may rightly doubt someone who, who says to you that they lived a sinless life. You may rightly doubt someone who says to you that they are one with the Father. You may rightly doubt someone who says to you that they are the only way to the Father. You may rightly doubt someone who says that they can forgive sins. You may rightly doubt someone who says they are the King of Kings. You may rightly doubt someone who says they will give you eternal life. You may rightly doubt someone who says that they are going to return and judge the world. That is, unless you watch that person die an excruciating death and then see them alive three days later. At that point, you can't doubt that person. And so the only choice we are left with is either to believe or to reject. I hope you have chosen to believe or or that you will make that choice. The resurrection of, of Jesus Christ, it means something very important to us. It means that we can count on everything that God has said. We can depend on everything that the Bible tells us. It tells us that God keeps His word. He keeps His promises. The Bible is God's word. All of it. And this is the this being the word of God, and it's guaranteed not to fail. God is unfailing. His word is unfailing. His promises are unfailing. The resurrection of Jesus Christ declares to us that we can count on all that God has told us will come to pass. And because the, the seal on the tomb that Christ was placed in, because that seal was broken, our hope is sealed through Christ. Romans chapter 15 verse 4 says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, 
that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. In other words, God has a proven track record of keeping his promises. And that means for us that we can count on God to do what he has said he is going to do. And that's, that's very good news for us. Put plain and simple, the gospel of Jesus Christ stands or falls on the resurrection. The resurrection is the culmination of what we think of as the life of Christ. That includes the birth, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and His ascension. Without the resurrection, the gospel becomes meaningless. A survey that was done in 2013 found that only 64% of American adults believe Jesus rose from the dead. 19% reject the central tenet of the resurrection. 17% are not sure. Now, I don't know what that same poll would reveal today, but I could guess that those numbers are far less today than they were just a few years ago. I think there's probably been a trend downward in those numbers. This morning, in 1 Corinthians 15, we will gain some insight into this doctrine of the resurrection. That is because, for some reason, the Corinthians who Paul was writing this letter to, had begun to doubt the doctrine of the resurrection. And in chapter 15, Paul brings them back to reality. So in chapter 15, we leave behind one section, that verses 11, or chapters 11 through 14. And we enter into another section. Now, unlike the previous chapters, ours today does not begin with the words, Now about nor is there some other indicator to show that Paul is answering a question, regardless because it is sandwiched between two Corinthian questions, we might rightly assume then that once Paul is addressing a question before this, he's still addressing a question in our chapter for today. Resurrection was a concern of the, of the Corinthian Christians, and they had expressed that concern to Paul. Now I have some good news for you. His answer to them is that when Christ returns, all believers, all the dead, will be resurrected. And all living Christians will be transformed to enter into the kingdom of God. To deny this, Paul says, is to misunderstand and misapply very important gospel truths. But what were the new ideas that the Corinthians were entertaining? Paul gives us some ideas of, of what the Corinthians were thinking or, or what different doctrines uh, the Corinthians were entertaining in their minds in this chapter. In verse 12, Paul says, Some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead. Later on, he gives one of the Corinthians' objections to the doctrine, saying, How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? See, there are several possible ways to view what the Corinthians were implying and what they had asked Paul here. Perhaps they said that Christians perish when they die, and that there is no future existence. This, this is kind of along the lines of the Epicureans and, and not so dissimilar to the views of the Sadducees. Christians, they may have also said Christians experience only an inner spiritual awakening. And that would have been more along the lines of early Gnosticism. Uh, this may have been connected with the previous uh, issue of hyper-spiritualism. They may have been saying that the Christian will live forever with Christ, but only as a disembodied kind of being. Now, I think we see a lot of this in the New Age today, 
And, and we see some of this philosophy, some of this theology creeping into the church today because the New Age, in a lot of ways, is being welcomed into the church. Now this would say that, the sec that at the second coming, there's no bodily resurrection, but some, some essence of the believer moves on to live forever in heaven. Now all three of those deny the clear teaching of Scripture, and, and they lead to an aberrant form of Christianity. Based on what we know of the Corinthians and the culture that they existed in, it seems more likely that, that number two or number three are the suspects. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is specifically proving the resurrection and, and really nothing else. And, and Paul does something quite genius here. He uses the hopes of the Corinthians in order to prove a different point. That is, that if Jesus reigns, he reigns over enemies. And death is the ultimate enemy. Therefore, the kingdom of Christ must involve the victory or the defeat of death. Paul shows us that, that death comes through Adam. Christ died and rose again to save us from sin and from the effects of sin. So then part of salvation will be from death in, in the form of bodily resurrection. Now we'll find that Paul starts from a sure foundation, which is Christ's own death and resurrection. The Corinthian Christians, they, many of them apparently, were... were not denying the resurrection of Jesus. That wasn't their issue. If they had, they would have been Christians. You can't deny the resurrection of Jesus and be a Christian. Um, Paul, of course, very familiar with the resurrection of Jesus. Remember that he had a physical encounter with Jesus uh, as he was on the road to Damascus. That was after Jesus' resurrection and after the birth of the church. And, and Paul received revelation of the gospel directly from Jesus. Galatians 1.12, Paul said, For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. The gospel that Paul taught had never needed change. It never needed revision because he received it directly from Jesus. And as a Christian and an apostle of Christ, his whole experience centered around the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Being that Paul had been a Pharisee, he would probably have made this argument many times when he was dealing with the Sadducees. So he knew how to approach the issue in a compelling and convincing way. As always, Paul does an incredible job of reasoning here in this chapter, and we can sense in the text how he does so with great patience. It's a very patient towards the Corinthians. It's important for Paul to explain this doctrine well because the, the saving gospel of the bodily resurrection of Jesus is absolutely essential to be gospel. Any other gospel that, that is not a any other gospel is not a gospel of salvation if it rejects or does not include the resurrection of Jesus. We we would call those aberrant we we might agree with what Paul uh, called them. He he referred to Speaking to Timothy, or writing to Timothy, he spoke of these other Gospels as, a, as doctrines of demons. But Paul doesn't only give us a logical proof of the physical resurrection of the believer. He throws in this divine revelation which God revealed to him through his spirit. We'll get to that in our chapter. Now, chapter 15, it's a very long chapter. We're going to break it up into two pieces. We're going to break it up into verses 1 through 34, then next week, verses 35 through 58. Now in this first half, Paul reminds the Corinthian Christians of his credentials to bring the gospel of salvation, the fallacy of rejecting the, the resurrection, and how the resurrection is part of God's plan of creation, the fall, redemption, and, and the recreation of all things. And lastly, he points out that many had been martyred having faith in the resurrection. So the goal of our message this morning is to understand what resurrection is and recognize its importance to the gospel. So let's dig straight in. Verse 1. You know, let's pray first and we'll dig in. Lord, we thank you for this morning. And Father, as we dig into your word, we ask that you open it up to us. 
Lord, I, I ask that that your words uh, would come out of my mouth, Lord, that not, not my own opinion or uh, any other thing, that it would be uh, your word alone. So, Father, we ask uh, for your blessing this morning in our study, that seeds would be planted in our hearts, that there, those seeds would sprout into a harvest, Lord, and good things in our lives, Lord, but also that would overflow those good things into the lives of others. We thank you in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, but which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So as we mentioned before, Paul does not address this as if there was a question posed to him. We, we suspect that it was a question that was put to him by the Corinthian Christians, but he doesn't respond that way. He doesn't, he doesn't couch his answer as, as he does in these other chapters. Now, resurrection is not a matter of end-time study or new revelation. It's really tied to what Christians already believe. Christ was resurrected. He was seen by many witnesses. If Paul was going to deviate from what he had first taught the Corinthians, then he surely could have. But he did not, and he doubles down on it with a, a really striking statement. If you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. Paul preached the gospel to them. That is the gospel that they were to hold firmly to. They weren't to add to it. They weren't to detract from it. Many corruptions of the gospel were around even that early on. And no corrupt gospel was a saving gospel. The gospel that was once for all delivered to the saints, as Jude 1.3 puts it, is the gospel by which men are saved. There's no other gospel. Any perversion of the central gospel message is a doctrine of demons. But very frankly, you cannot take away the resurrection and have a gospel that saves. And so Paul uses very strong words. If you hold fast that word which I preach to you. Now, either Paul is deluded, a, a masterful con artist, or he was an actual official representative of Jesus Christ. He reminds the Corinthians that it was the revelation of the gospel to him from the Lord Jesus that they received. And they received all of it. And much to the, the chagrin of uh, the ecumenist, ecumenist movement today, you can't just break the gospel. You can't break it up into pieces. You know, the, the majority definition of ecumenism is a movement promoting cooperation and better understanding among different religious groups, or denominations. Now that sounds wonderful. That sounds just fantastic. Shouldn't we, shouldn't we be doing that? Well, the problem is, is that definition leaves something out. What it leaves out is the how. How does ecumenism work? It de-emphasizes parts of the gospel in order to make it more acceptable or convenient. It doesn't seek to raise up to the gospel. It seeks to diminish the gospel to the, to the place of people, to the place of opinion, really, I should say. De-emphasizing certain parts of the gospel that are perhaps complicated or difficult. In the case of the church, it might be labeled uh, something like traditional or, or tolerated or, or something that is, is taught with kind of a, a wink and a nod. And that's what a lot of people like to do. Uh, on an individual level, people want Jesus to be a, a good person who lived an example of a good life for us to follow. Or they want Jesus to be just the miracle worker who can be summoned to do our bidding. They want to be a, a rule setter, giving us some hard and fast rules so that when we obey them, we can feel really good about ourselves. 
And you don't want him to be so loving that he just winks at sin and evil and he says, oh, just, just come on into my Father's kingdom. Some want the good parts without the realization that it all centers on a sacrifice for sin. And that the resurrection is the proof that that sacrifice was acceptable to God. Now that's why Paul says, unless you believed in vain. A better translation of that is, otherwise you believed in vain. Otherwise you believed in vain. What, what use are all the good sayings if we are left in the sinful state that we are? What good are the scriptures if we can't ever hope to really satisfy them? To, to really satisfy them? The issue of sin, sacrifice, and salvation through the resurrection, it's the whole deal. If not for that, then, then you're basically wasting your time. Verse 3. For I delivered to you first, first of all, that which I also received, that, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again at the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, then by the Twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. So, you know, Paul wants them to understand that he didn't invent what he taught them. He faithfully passed on the gospel, which he... And, and the apostles had received his first his use of first is not that he was the first to deliver the gospel though in regards to the Corinthians he most certainly was is that water? yeah I'll take some water thank you So Paul did not invent this gospel that he taught them. He received it from Jesus Christ himself. It's the same gospel that all the other apostles taught. And he brought it, certainly the first one to bring it to the Corinthians, as we see in Scripture. Although others did bring uh, the gospel to the Corinthians at various times. This was the, the gospel that... The gospel message that Paul is still preaching, even in this letter, is the same one that he originally preached to them. And, you know, all else that he taught depends on that gospel message. It's a, a statement of importance. What is most important? First things first. You know, and in the manner in which Paul puts forward this most important gospel message, it, it comes across as a creed. I mean, if you write your Bible, put brackets around those verses, verses 3 all the way to verse 7. And it, it, it resembles very strongly the Apostles' Creed. And, and it may have been a part of, of what formed it, actually. Now, certainly, these are things that we find this in those verses. These are things that not just Paul taught, these are things that all the Apostles taught. This is the gospel. So Paul mentions, mentions two crucial elements to the veracity of the resurrection. Speaking of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The foundation of all future resurrection. Old Testament scriptures and then eyewitness accounts. So let's consider first the prophetic testimony of the Old Testament scriptures. Verses 3 and 4 mention the propitiatory nature of the Messiah's death, of his burial, his resurrection on the third day. The Old Testament predicts the substitutionary death of the Messiah. In Genesis, a lamb died to provide cover for Adam and Eve. That's our, that's our generous God making the naked, covering the naked sinner by sacrifice. Then there's, there's a type of Jesus that we see in Joseph. Later in Exodus, God instructs Israel to sacrifice unblemished lambs and put the blood on their doors so that that, that final plague, the angel of death, would not strike dead their firstborn. 
There are future pictures in Scripture, such as we find in the book of Ruth, that is the, the Goel Redeemer, the, the kinsman Redeemer, uh, which is a picture of Jesus. But we also find the substitutionary death of Jesus spoken of by the prophets, Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. In that, in that verse, there's, there's some contrast that we see there. There's a, a, a use of contrast in that, that very prophecy. You know, he versus our, his wounds, our transgressions, his bruises, our iniquities, his stripes, our peace. This suggests to us that he was killed in innocence in order to pay for our sins. Only a spotless lamb could be used in sacrifice, and that lamb had to die. Now the prophets also predicted the Messiah's burial. Isaiah 53, 9, They made his grave with the wicked, but, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Jesus was buried in the unused, borrowed tomb of a rich man's fam family, Joseph of Arimathea. That grave was located very near to Calvary, where the wicked were put to death. The scriptures also revealed that the Messiah was to be raised on the third day. And, and Matthew 12 reports how Jesus said that as Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, he too would be three days in the earth. And we find this also in the Old Testament in places like Psalm 16, verses 9 through 10. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. It's vitally important for us to understand that everything Jesus did was foretold as part of God's master plan. None of it happened by accident. None of it was coincidence. It wasn't made up as it went along. As we might suspect in the, the case of someone who was killed in public and then seen alive later, there is eyewitness testimony. In fact, Paul mentions several groups of individuals. He starts with Peter, whom the Lord confronted in Luke 24. And Jesus appeared to Peter and then all the disciples. The chapter tells us that there were others with the disciples that saw him. In addition, there were 500 people who saw him alive and resurrected. Now, I've heard it argued that surely, surely, uh, somebody of that 500, at least, you know, maybe three quarters, or not three quarters, maybe a quarter of them, at least, would have written down that they had seen Jesus. But we forget that in that day, not many would have been able to write or would have had reason to write. I mean, why write when you can just tell it? For example, one of the greatest happenings of probably our lifetime was the World Trade Towers being knocked down, being destroyed on, on September 11th. Yet, how many of us wrote something down about it? You know, something that was widely disseminated and can be found today. Probably not many of us. And keep in mind, the modern press was not around at the, in that time. But the fact of 500 eyewitnesses is recorded in Scripture. Now, that Paul mentions it here is very interesting, considering he was writing this letter... 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus. So it must be the case that he knew enough about those 500 people to say that the majority were still alive at the time. Additionally, the Roman historian Josephus, he records that Jesus was resurrected. Jesus' brother James also saw the Lord resurrected. He didn't believe at first, but joined the group and later became leader of the church in Jerusalem and wrote the epistle of James. And lastly, Paul who met Jesus on the road to Damascus, as we have recorded in Acts chapter 9. And Paul refers to his experience as one born out of due time. Another way to put that is miscarriage. He refers to his birth as a miscarriage because he did not come to faith in the normal way. Now these, these things demonstrate that the resurrection 
was no hallucination. It wasn't some mystical event for scattered individuals. It was a fact that was repeatedly demonstrated to many different people at different times in different places. And at the, same, at the time this letter was written, they were alive in order to corroborate what Paul was saying. But the greater point is that all of these were saved by and preached the same gospel that Paul had received and continued to faithfully pass along. Verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but, by, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. So Paul, you know, Paul's experience after the resurrection of Jesus was, was unique to the other apostles. He, he saw Jesus and was commissioned as an apostle after Jesus' ascension. And so the, the Corinthians may have doubted that Paul's witness of Jesus and, and his gospel was you know, as good as that of the other apostles. And while he considered his place at the bottom of the apostolic heap, I guess you'd say, he states that God's grace towards even one who, persecutes, uh, who persecuted the church, his grace even towards somebody who's, who's done such a terrible thing, still saves. In other words, the only sin that renders the gospel ineffective is that of rejecting the gospel. And again, Paul says, all the apostles put the same emphasis on the resurrection. And so the, the resurrection, it's a non-negotiable aspect of the gospel. Simply put, without the resurrection, there is no Christianity, there's no salvation and no hope for mankind. And so Paul is going to zero in on this fact. Denying the resurrection of the body means denying the resurrection of Jesus and thus the saving gospel. Verse 12. Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. So Paul, he's, he's bringing the reproach here. How can the Christian on one hand proclaim the, the, proclaim the risen Jesus, but on the other hand deny the doctrine of resurrection? And Paul is pointing out, he's pointing out something that's, that's simple and, and obvious. Christ rose from the dead, and so it cannot be said that no one rises from the dead. You can't hold to both ideas. If you reject the resurrection, then you do not understand the gospel. So, yeah, the resurrection is very important. And Paul implies that, the, that to reject the resurrection of the Christian means that we doubt the power of God, that we have cut ourselves off from a central motive for holy living. Let's consider those two things. Now, in regards to doubting the power of God, Jesus told the Sadducees that their rejection of the resurrection was not simply an intellectual choice. Rather, they fell short in their faith in the God who could raise the dead. Paul, perhaps thinking of this, makes the same point later on in our chapter, all the way down in verse 35. Now, people reject the doctrine generally because if, you know, they, they think, well, if, if I, being smart, so we all think we're smart, right? If I, being smart, cannot imagine the resurrection of the body, then the idea must be just absurd. And so everyone who believes in the resurrection, then, must be a, a dunce compared to me. Because I believe it to be absurd. And so everyone, then, except the one who doubts the resurrection is the one who is foolish in that person's eyes. But in God's eyes, it's the other way around. Those who believe Him, believe Him at His word, what He has said, are the ones 
who are wise, and those who doubt him are the ones who are foolish. Now in regards to motive for holy living, if we do not believe that God is powerful enough to figure out how to raise the dead, then how could he be powerful enough to ever judge and punish me for my sins? So then we might reason that if, if my body will perish when I die, then my bad moral choices will perish with it. The physical, in other words, will just pass away and then I will enter into eternity with a pure spirit or a pure soul or whatever. Therefore, I don't have to take care about my moral choices. But the truth is that God will not do away with our body. He raises us and judges. Those who reject Jesus will be judged for their sins. Those who receive Jesus will be rewarded for their good works. Now because of that hope, Christians can remain steadfast despite obstacles. And Paul later says in verse 58 of this chapter, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, immovable always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now before we move on, we should probably address something. That is, what is the resurrection that we are concerned with here? Several people were resurrected in Scripture. The son of uh, Zarephath's widow in 1 Kings uh, 17. The son of the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings 4. A dead man comes back to life when he, teaches, when he, he touched Elijah's bones, recorded in 2 Kings 13. Jesus resurrected the widow's son at Nain in, in Luke 7. Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead in Matthew 9. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in John 11. And the Bible records that many were resurrected at Jesus' crucifixion in Matthew 28. Those people, they were raised, but they were all raised to life only to die again. But Jesus was, according to the scriptures, the firstborn from the dead. See, others were resurrected, but they weren't resurrected in a permanent way. They were raised back in their old bodies. But Jesus was resurrected into his glorified body, and life he was resurrected into life that just doesn't end and never to be separated from the Father. That, that is central to the gospel. Hebrews 7 says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. His life is eternal. His priesthood is eternal. His atonement is eternal. His ability to preserve is eternal. Resurrection is central to the gospel. And so Paul's logical argument then is, if the resurrection is central to the gospel and is included in everything we say, how can you just remove it from your beliefs? It's possible that the Corinthians, since they were surrounded, you know, they were in a Greek culture, Greek Greco Roman, a Greek Roman culture. It's possible that they were adopting some Greek philosophy that the body is evil and would not be raised to life. You know, they would say that any resurrection would happen only in the soul. Now we talked about this a while back, and I can't remember what chapter we were in when we talked about it, but I think it was one of the earlier chapters in 1 Corinthians, so you can go back and, and look that up and find it. Now in contrast to that, Jesus presented a very real body to his disciples. And Jesus even proved this to his disciples. Luke 24 records that the disciples thought that Jesus was just a disembodied spirit. And he said to them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of fish and he ate it in their presence. In addition, Thomas felt of Jesus' wounds in order to satisfy his own doubts. Jesus is very physical in the resurrection. And so will we, after resurrection, be in new physical bodies. That's important. New physical bodies. I look at my body right now and I think, I don't want to be resurrected into this body. I want to be resurrected into a new physical body. 
the new physical life. It, it's the it's at the foundation of the gospel. If there is no resurrection, then Jesus' sacrifice, it, just, it didn't take them. And so we have no hope. You know, if his resurrection didn't take, if it wasn't acceptable to God, then my faith is worthless and I'm a fool. And your faith is worthless and you with me are fools. And that's the way it is for those who have their faith in something that is not Jesus Christ. Those who have their faith in government. In evolution. In some guru or special teacher or, or some religious leader. They may boast about it. But in God's eyes, they're fools. And none of those things that they are placing their faith in have ever demonstrated that they can bring about everlasting life. Not a single one. Let's keep going. Verse 15. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. If there is no resurrection, then all the apostles were just liars. And that's a pretty bold statement. But it would be true. In fact, if it's not true, if the resurrection is not true, then I'm a liar as well. Moreover, the Corinthians, they needed to understand the ramifications of rejecting the resurrection. That would mean they had not believed in the gospel of God. They had believed in some other false gospel. And so their sins had not been forgiven. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is because without the resurrection, there is no proof that Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient. But the resurrection of Jesus implies the resurrection of his people. So many today place their hope in, in this life only. And we should have compassion for them. I, I think that most people have an innate sense that life goes on after death. What's really going on is that they are unwilling to yield authority of their life to the Lord. Verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, and so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are Christ at his, at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. 
I'm not winking at you guys. My eye is doing some weird thing. <laughs> Paul has been, been speaking hypothetically. <laughs> I think you guys would think I was trying to tell you something secret and get that deal. <laughs> That's what's annoying. <laughs> so Paul has been, been speaking hypothetically because every Christian knows that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And the good news is therefore anchored in reality. In verse 20, but now could be rendered as indeed. Now in this section, Paul shows what has been in, earlier implied. That is that our destiny is unchangeably entwined with Jesus's. His death and resurrection for our sins means that our death will be resolved in resurrection at the return of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of great stuff in, the, in these verses here. The idea of the first fruits, that refers back to Leviticus 23. The Jews would, would bring the, the first part or the first fruits of the harvest to the Lord as an offering. Jesus is the first of the harvest of souls, bringing them into new life. Jesus' resurrected body is a proof that a new body awaits us as well. Death came through Adam's sin. Life came through Jesus' obedience and sacrificial death, burial, and his resurrection. Now, staying in the old life, we might call it the Adam life, means ultimate death. That is, death, that is, is separation from God in, in everything that is good. But not only does Jesus bring new life, he also is also now the ultimate authority and ruler. It really is all about Jesus. And death really is our enemy. Death was never supposed to happen. It's wrong. We brought it about by deciding that the enemy knew better than God and that we knew better how to run our own lives. And it killed us. Now death itself is gone in Jesus through the resurrection. Verse 29. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead, if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. In this section here, right off the bat, we should be asking some questions. What in the world did Paul mean by baptized for the dead? Obviously, the Corinthian Christians understood what he was talking about. Otherwise, he would have explained what he meant by this. Paul is apparently directing it to others by saying, what will they do? There was a heretical doctrine, even then, in which living representatives were baptized for the dead. And in fact, that's a practice that continues today. It's we see it in the Mormon church. Now, certainly Paul would not have approved of that aberration of the gospel of the apostles. What we don't understand today is that this phrase was being used metaphorically. It, it referred to those Christians who had been martyred for their faith. With persecution increasing, it is likely that many of the Corinthians knew some people who had been martyred. That could be who Paul was speaking of, saying, If there is no resurrection, by what hope did the martyrs readily give up their life? And it's a good thing for us to consider, too. But then every day, you know, for all believers, every day is a dying of sorts. 
Paul says, I die daily. He sacrifices his best life now, which he could enjoy because of his faith in Jesus Christ. But he invests in his future, which he refers to in Philippians 1.23 as being better by far. But Paul was, and probably more than us today, well, definitely more than us today, Paul was risking his life daily by his faith and his preaching of the gospel. There's a time when, when this will be the case for us, but today, the greatest that can happen to us is that we lose a business or lose a job. Lose family or lose friends. Get befriended on Facebook. <laughs> Tragedy of tragedies. But you can really get a sense these days that we're no more than one election away from persecution like we've never seen before. And it is very, very important that every Christian vote. Very important. There are many, many people who are running, and I guess that's being whittled down as you know as the weeks go by. Um, there's some who are running who speak great words, and we want desperately to believe what they are saying that they will do. But you can look at them. You can look at the fruit of their lives. You can look at all these things and, and you can see they may call themselves Christians. But the fruit's just not there. And I think fruit, looking at the fruit that we see in the life of a candidate who is running for the highest office in our country is what we vote on is where we put our vote. The candidate who is not ashamed of the gospel, who is not ashamed of being called a fool or foolish, uneducated, but the one who is willing to stand up for Christ and for in that way and for this country. I think in the last few elections, I think there were many Christians who just got caught up in the whole thing and thought that, that they were voting for this so that we could all have this good feeling. You know? that this country was united, but we discovered that we voted for somebody who was dividing the country instead. Now we desperately need to put in that office not somebody who speaks words that we want to hear, but somebody who we can look in their life and see that they are living Christian. We'll probably talk more about these things as we uh, draw nearer and nearer to some election time. Um, it's not a, it's not a topic that uh, that many will will speak on. From the pulpit, not one that I actually plan on talking about today. I'm not even sure how I got here. Um, churches today are very afraid of, of losing their tax exempt status, and so they're willing to kind of, you know, not talk about things that that could cause something like that to happen. And there's a lot of controversy today about churches being tax exempt. 
Um, we are not 501c3. You know, I could have applied for that. I could have made us 501c3. But that felt like making us beholden to the government. And I, in no means, want to be in the hands of an unrighteous government. A government that's proving itself day in, day out. That, that is unrighteous, ungodly. Now, that doesn't mean for you guys who, who follow your taxes and all that, that doesn't mean that you know, you're risking an audit or something like that. Because churches don't have to be 501c3 to be tax exempt. There's a lot of benefits being 501c3 for the church itself. But you can still obviously file your taxes and file it, you know, use your contributions as, as, uh, for your taxes. I have the feeling that the tax exempt status of churches is something that is going to be going away. And I also have the feeling that, that until that point, that there's going to be a lot of compromise in the church as churches try to figure out a way for that not to happen. But because we're not 501c3, I don't care. I don't have to. We could be uh, non-tax exempt tomorrow. And I'd be able to just shrug my shoulders and go, well. And that also means that I don't have to worry about what I'm saying up here. Now certainly that doesn't mean that somebody's not going to watch this or, or hear something that I'm teaching and, and decide oh, I'm going to sue them until they're closed. Okay. We can we can meet in small groups. <laughs> we don't have to have this building. But we're going to honor God in everything. And we're not going to capitulate to those who prefer a dumbed down gospel. We're just not going to do it. We're going to teach the word, all of it. We're going to hold to the word, all of it. And that may mean some pretty stiff persecution at some point. That's okay. The king's still on the throne. And we have, we have never endured persecution the way that Paul would have spoken of persecution. But we do know, and I think the Holy the Holy Spirit uh, testifies to us in our hearts that persecution is coming. Paul says that he could boast in this, and well, we can too, because it's done for God, the God who raises the dead, the God who overcomes all adversity. You know, living for this life only. It can have a couple of outcomes. It can make us very hopeless, which there are many in the world today who are just hopeless. It can also make us unprincipled, licentious. You know, you you can say something like, "Well, you only go around, you know, once in life, so you know you've got to grab all the gusto while you can." I think that was a beer commercial. But, but, you know, it, it speaks to the way a lot of folks, a lot of folks, a lot of folks live their lives. Just doing any and all kinds of evil that their flesh brings to mind. Because, hey, if there's nothing after this life, then there's no accountability, and, and what, what I do just doesn't matter. That may have been part of the attitude that was, that was kind of creeping into the Corinthian church. 
But Paul, he's, he's speaking very strongly to them about it. He's saying that you, know, you can't use a false philosophical construct to justify sinful behavior. Sin is sin. Evil is evil. If you sin, there are consequences. The resurrection is so serious that not believing in it is the same as sinning. It is so central to the gospel that without it, there really is no gospel at all. And it's so central that Paul says that all of the hardships that he and the apostles have undergone are just fool's errands if there is no promise of resurrection. And Paul was always under the danger of extreme punishment by the Roman Empire. But he was a Roman citizen. So it seems odd then that he mentions being exposed uh, to death by wild beasts. But when it comes to Christians, it grows more and more apparent, I believe, to us today that the law can be compromised on. So I don't doubt that even though Paul was a Roman citizen, at some point he was exposed to death by wild beasts. And God must have pulled something out and gotten him out of that somehow. Which wouldn't that be an awesome story to hear about? But we don't have that recorded. We don't know what happened. And maybe the, maybe Paul, you know, is, is is just putting it this out there hypothetically. You know what, folks, this can happen. Maybe he just wants to put that in, in our minds, in the minds of the Corinthians, in our minds today. Maybe he's saying something like, "Well, you know, if there's no resurrection, then it's it's better to eat than be eaten." But if there is resurrection, it's much better to be eaten. Better to die for the sake of Christ than to compromise. And in closing, it's important. It's important that we consider. You know, is your hope only for this life? If that's the case, then there are you and many other people that are in that same boat. Not knowing whether to, to just party it up or to fall down and cry. Most weeks, they're probably a combination of both. But, but I want you to know that you don't have to do either one. There is life after death. There is also death after life. The certain truth is that we all are faced with a fork in the road. One fork takes us to everlasting life filled with joy. The other to an eternity apart from anything that we would consider really good. That's death after life. And we have to choose which fork, which way we go. And we do that, as Paul stated in Romans, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So if you have not done that, you can do that today. Simply praying to God, praying, Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins. You are my Lord and my Savior. may not come out that way for you. Maybe something much more passionate, much more tearful or, or cried out. But God will hear. You know, in regards to us who believe, what do you stand on? How good is your grasp on the gospel of Jesus Christ? This chapter contains a really good summation of it. That Jesus died, was buried, and rose all according to God's plan in the scriptures. 
He did that to rid us of an endemic evil that is killing us. And his resurrection was seen by hundreds of reliable witnesses following the, the same Jesus now rules the universe as Lord. There is no one else, no Muhammad, no Buddha, no Krishna, no other person who is alive after being dead. You can go to the tomb of Muhammad, you'll find Muhammad bones. You can go to the tomb of Buddha, you'll find Buddha bones. But Jesus in his tomb is empty. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. For this time in your word. Lord, we probably every Wednesday, Sunday, Sunday evening, we, we probably to some degree take take it for granted that we're able to assemble here and worship you and, and study your uh, holy word. And we, we confess to you that, that, that we take it for granted, that we, we at times uh, approach it lightly as something that is optional or something that we just do because it's tradition, because we always have done it. Lord, I pray that that the weight of tradition would fall off our backs. That we would not take our time in your word for granted. That we would seek to please you in every part of our lives. that you would be glorified, magnified to all those around us. That we would look to persecution not as detrimental but as proof that we are yours. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would instill in us courage. Courage to, to face what the future holds. Courage to take a stand. Courage not to capitulate to what the world wants but to uphold your word and to speak the truth even though people don't want to hear it and even though we may physically suffer for it Lord, we pray for the leaders of this nation. We pray that those who don't know you, that don't know Jesus as the Lord and Savior, that, that, they, that they would come to know Jesus. That those who proclaim themselves to be Christians during the election, but then did things that were decidedly different, after they were elected, Lord, that you would rebuke them, that they would repent, that they would turn back to you, 
Lord, for those who are wicked, those who, who sit in, in seats in, in our government and they are just wicked and evil and they have the Antichrist spirit, Lord, we just we pray that, that they would be removed from office. Not in a violent way, but Lord, that they would be as per the, the laws of this nation, the foundation of this nation, they would be voted out. And Father, that the Christians would get up and vote. And that they would vote not according to the words that we hear from their mouths, but according to the fruit that we see in their lives. Help us to be discerning. Lord, again, thank you for this morning. We desire to be doers of your word and not hearers only. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and everyone say, Amen.